but yet, here I did it for almost 25 years and been getting awards from the agents, natural resources, the industry and all that for breaking the law. <laughs> Hate to see what I did if I followed the law, what they give me, but anyways. So people would ask, how come First Nations don't participate? Uh, there was a time when we were at FSC certification, when we had it, in Eel Ground alone. Here's a community of 400 people. And you look at the stats of uh, how many people work in the forestry industry in New Brunswick, how many, like uh, employment, uh, at that time it was around 10%. 10% of the workforce worked in forestry. In Eel Ground alone, when I had FSC certification, uh, and had uh, the community of uh, 800 people, I had 65 people working on that land base. Women, children, uh, women, men, uh, summer students. Uh, I had uh, individuals that were doing their thesis work up here at UMB coming to Yield Ground to study us to see what management where we're doing different. Mind you, timber management is timber management. You know, you manage timber to sell, but the difference with First Nation timber management we just don't look at the 10 species of trees that are considered commercial trees. We look at the, all the trees. We look at all the plants. We look at everything. And how do you manage that whole land base in order to ensure you took it out in stages. And you kept what was important to the community that did not have a commercial value. It had a medicinal value. And just on that 900 hectares of ground, that we, uh, that particular block was happening, that we identified 297 medicinal plants on that one piece of ground that was 900 hectares. Every plant was cataloged. Uh, uh, you know, of course, with the scientific Latin name, its English name, its French name, its Mi'kmaq name, and its purpose of what the medicine was used for. Not had to prepare it, just a purpose. Because there's a lot of medicines out there that are very dangerous. If you mix it wrong, you could be on the high for your life type of thing. But, it, you know, <laughs> there's, uh, there's one, one thing I keep, uh, unique thing about a spruce tree. There's a certain thing that grows on a, a spruce tree every year. It has a certain color to it. If you collect, if you collect that, it will outdo anything New Brunswick is trying to do with this cannabis business. <laughs> um, we're working on a Mi'kmaq uh, Nation uh, strategic plan. We'll have the draft probably done by the uh, in the December, and hopefully a working plan uh, by March of this year. If that's successful, you'll see, hopefully over the next five years, the first full tree utilization operation in New Brunswick. Where you don't have a lumber mill here, you don't have a, a pellet plant here, you don't have a bioelectric plant here, you don't have... This is going to be one facility that utilizes the whole tree off an FSC certified piece of ground. So it's going to be so different. It's going to produce its own electricity, it's going to produce its own heat, it's going to produce its own lumber, it's going to produce its own... Uh, uh, a, a bioelectricity, it's going to produce its own uh, fuel wood, it's going to produce everything in one site. That's what we mean by full tree utilization. We're investigating how we can take full tree utilization into full species utilization. So you would take, you know, your softwood species and your hardwood species like maple or what you harvest and you utilize that all in one site. So in that strategic plan, when you're using the pole tree, this doesn't mean that the Mi'kmaq will be clear-cut. No, no, this is, this is, this is, uh, this is commercial harvest, this is, uh, there'll be no clear-cut. No, no, we don't, we don't do clear-cut. The largest, the largest, uh, if you want to call it clear-cut, we don't even call it clear-cut. The largest cut we would do uh, is probably 10 hectares. And the thing is, even though you go in, all, all the activities we do, uh, there's no need to plant. Because there's one thing about New Brunswick, there's one thing about the Acadia Forest. It has the ability to regenerate very quickly. We're lucky in this part of the world that our forest does regen regenerate very quickly. 
And there's one thing we learned. I remember when we had, uh, when we first started doing the management plan in Eel Grand, of course, I had your Irvins up there. I had, you know, at that time it was your Blake Brunson's, your uh, Drew Barrymore's, your Joe O'Neill's, all the, you know, all these uh, top forestry fellas that were seen as the leaders of the forestry industry. I had them on that piece of ground in Eel Grand. And I asked them, what should I do with this? And mind you, you're looking at a piece of ground that in 1970, 75, the budworm went through it. And it was, uh, you know, 75% balsam fir, old balsam fir. And the budworm went through it. Looked pretty sickly. You know, it was pretty dead, according to a forester's mind. And of course, their first suggestion to me, uh, Sam Porter's from Fresher's at that time, he said, Steve, burn her down. Burn her down and plant it. And I said, see ya. <laughs> Not going to happen. And if you look at that time in the 60s and 70s and 80s, what was the primary species of tree that they planted out there on Crown Land? Anyone? Anybody know? Jack pine. Roughly 30% of this province is planted with jack pine now. Did you ever look at those stands? There's nothing natural about them. You look at a, a planted jack pine stand, and then you look at a wild jack pine. They look, you think you're looking at a different species, but it's the same species. There's a wild jack pine, pine growing around with other species of trees, and it's straight, tall, straight, and, 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 and it's a majestic looking tree. But if you go to a monoculture jack pine stand, you don't know where that tree's trying to grow. Is it going up this way, that way? You know, you don't know where it's going to grow. And they're finding now that a lot of those stands are collapsing simply because of the type of weather that we're having. The, the, you know, the, the wet, heavy, sleet, a hail type of storm. Well, all those heavy branches are getting laden with this type of stuff and it just break off. So a lot of those jack pine stands now are, are slowly uh, falling apart on their own with no help. There's one thing we did... Uh, a little bit, of planta little bit of plantation work in eel ground uh, because we were, we, were, we were reclaiming some old shell rock pits that uh, historically uh, the bridge construction and all the highway construction around eel ground and around Anderson Bridge and where the, the repat mill used to be, a lot of the shale came from eel ground to, to build those sites. And of course, you know, we all know what a shell rock pit looks like. It's a big hole in the ground. And Hardly nothing grows here. When it fills up with water, it grows with cattails and that again because it creates a wet, wet environment. Uh, we end up reclaiming some of those pits. And what we did, we went to, we had a, saw, a small sawmill in Eelgrand at the time. And we were producing uh, clean sawdust because it was a, ba it was a, it was a band saw, a, a circular saw, excuse me. And it, there was no oil not, not on the uh, chip. So we took that clean chip and all the berms that were left behind the, behind the, uh, within the pit from piling up the, you know, grubbing up the topsoil off. We took that, shaped that whole pit up. We mixed the sawdust in it. We planted four species of trees instead of a monoculture. We planted uh, uh, some red pine, black spruce, uh, yellow birch, and some burr oak, because burr oak was natural to the area. You should see that stand today. The only trouble we had uh, in trying to make sure one species stayed there was the oak because the deer like the small oak, so we end up having to put tubes around the oaks until they got to a certain height so the deers couldn't eat them. So, beautiful stand. Uh, we also took another stand, and instead of red pine, we put jack pine in it with the four different species. And the red pine, uh, excuse me, the jack pine in that stand grew just like if it was a natural jack pine. Not out like this, out like that. Because the other species there, we talk about the mesiofer, you know, is, I think it's what it's called, where plants actually interact with each other. You really see that when you plant more than one species on a site. You really can experience, you, you, until you see it, and I often say when I'm in a, a room like this, if you really want to experience it, of what I'm talking about, come out. Come out and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. I remember one time, uh, Forestry Canada was uh, experimenting with uh, white birch. And they were giving out these hybrid white birch to grow better veneer. They grow a faster a white birch tree so you'll have a veneer quality fiber quicker. So, 
I brought one home with me. It's in my yard. My yard's a kind of a unique thing too. I got 70 species of trees in my yard. I started them all from seeds. Uh, from the wild, brought them home. Because it was kind of a thing that I wanted to do as I was growing up so I could take the kids from the school, from the, the schools in the First Nation, bring them right to my backyard. On an acre of ground, I have 70 species of trees on it. And I took this one hybrid uh, white birch, I mean, excuse, uh, white birch, and I put it beside a wild white birch, across my driveway from it. And when I planted it, of course, you know, it was only, yay, I think it was, it was a bare root stock, it was two, two what they call it, two, three. Two, two years in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the jippy, uh, in a pot, three years out in the field. That's what they call it, a two, three. Uh, so anyways, I put it beside uh, uh, the wild uh, white birch. I was roughly 15 years old, you know, about that round. Growing it, you know, growing up, a big, big crook in it and everything growing up. It was amazing how fast that hybrid grew. Like it was growing four or five feet a year. Unbelievable. And it caught up to the uh, wild one pretty quick. But shortly after catching up to that, all of a sudden, the yellow jackets and the wasp started attacking it. And a lot of the paper, a lot of the paper that is made in a bee nest comes from bees just, you know, getting it from a tree and going and make the nest. And I said, they're making a nest somewhere. And I never thought too much of them. They were attacking, the, you know, you see all the holes in there with the wasp just chewing at, putting the holes in the tree. Eventually, they girdled that whole tree. Killed it within two years. While I couldn't understand why it was attacking that one, but not touching the wild one, not touching the wild white birch, because they were only four feet apart. You could see where the bees went over and try, but stopped. So I wanted to find a nest uh, that second year, and of course I found it. And normally when you see the uh, bee's nest made, it, 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 it's, it's, you know, it, it's a dull gray color to it. You know, the, the bar, you know, the paper that they make out of it is really dull gray. It's, it's not coated paper, right? It, it, it's a really dull gray, the bee nest, any beehive. This one had yellow, yellow strands through it, red strands through it, blue strands through it. The colors that they got from that hybrid, hybrid birch tree in making their nest was unbelievable. Like, beautiful nest, but you never see that type of nest in the wild, that type of uh, beehive. So... There was a reason why those bees, those uh, wasps and the yellow jackets, attacked that tree. Was it giving off some type of aroma? Uh, aroma? Was it giving off, uh, you know, um, uh, some particular taste when they first attacked it? And it would taste sweet to them? What was it? I only had one tree. You couldn't do a scientific study on it because the tree was gone. Uh, Dr. Judy Lowe, uh, I don't know if you remember her, Cecilia. Dr. Julie Lowe was where we got the species. So I called her up, uh, but she left Canadian Forest Service and she's way out in, out in Europe somewhere now. Uh, so I couldn't track anybody down because I was curious if the other hybrids, if they knew where they planted it, uh, what did they look like? Were they attacked? Oh, it's just, just an isolated situation. I don't know. But it just goes to show you what comes here, what's in this part of the world naturally, Good luck in changing it. Good luck in introducing other species to it. We see what's going on with the jack pine plantations. Irvin's having his hands full with Norway spruce. He thought by growing Norway spruce that he was going to get, they were going to get great lumber. Anytime they cut a Norway spruce now and saw it up, it warps. It doesn't stay straight. So that was a waste of time. Rather than dealing with the species that you have here and working on what you got, and now, of course, for our culture, we're very worried about the uh, black ash because the Imrabor beetles here. And I remember warning uh, uh, Natural Resource Canada 20 years ago when this beetle was first brought into Win. Uh,